Obviously, technology haven't done their things. I thought they had it switched on. <sighs> Honestly. <laughs> you, just, you can't get the staff anymore. <laughs> but as, as I was saying, driving over this morning, and somebody was saying spring has sprung, but it's maybe not so much that spring has sprung as spring has bitten. <laughs> it's because it is rather cold this morning, but it's lovely to see the brightness and just to... And just to come and we, we worship the Lord and worship our, our Creator, um, God. Now, and as we come this morning, okay, and we're not moving. I'm moving it on, but it isn't moving on in the, in the screen. Nope. All right, yes. Oh, slight change. Okay. Right, I'm not sure if this is working or not. But anyway, we will persevere. We will try. <laughs> so as we come this morning, the Lord be with you. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the forgiveness of our sins and to pray for the needs of the world, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. O oh Lord, open our lips. Let us worship the Lord. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn, and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit, and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we'll stand now and sing our first hymn. Um, it's hymn 445 in Mission Praise. Lord, the light of your love is shining. So let's stand and sing.
I think, great, thanks. I think this isn't working, so I think you're just going to have to move it from the, from the back. Okay. So as we come to our time of confession, compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him. So let us then renounce our willfulness and ask his, mer and ask his mercy by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. So let us kneel as we come and confess our sins to the Lord. And we say together the words of confession. O oh God, O oh God, our loving Father in heaven, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have broken your commandments. We have often been selfish and we have not loved you as we should. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're going to say together our, the psalm appointed for today. It's Psalm um, 19 and can be found on page 611 of the, um, of the prayer books. Um, 611, Psalm 19. And it's one of those wonderful psalms just um, really celebrating and declaring um, the glory of God and his creation and then also um, about talking about his law and his word. So it is just one of those, it's a, it's a wonderful psalm. So let's just really think about the words as we say it together. And if we say alternate verses. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. They have neither speech nor language, and their voices are not heard. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun that comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber and rejoices as a champion to run his course. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant taught, and in keeping them there is great reward. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins, lest they get dominion over me. So shall I be undefiled and innocent of great offence. And we will have our um, first Bible reading. So thanks, Barbara. First Corinthians starting at verse 18 to 25, and can be found in Pew Bibles 1144. For the message of the, of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. For us who have been saved, it is, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. 
and the intelligence or the intellect of the intelligence I will I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of the of the this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Thanks Barbara. And we're going to stand again and sing our next hymn. Um, there is, a rede- there is a Redeemer, 673, and I think the children um, will go out um, to Sunday school um, during this hymn. So 673, There is a Redeemer. for our um, second Bible reading. Thanks. The second reading is taken from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, and can be found on Pew Bibles 1065. When it was almost time for the Jews' Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple's courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins 
of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that this is, it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. When the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 40, 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then he, they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. I think first day I'll get rid of this because obviously technology is not working this morning. <laughs> I didn't have any fancy pictures for my sermon anyway, so you're so not missing anything. Apologies, I'm standing with my back. Am I just like standing with my back? But anyway, Lord, take my words and speak through them and take our ears and minds to hear what you want to say to each one of us this morning. The hymn, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, while there's no doubt that Jesus was compassionate, caring, loving, and gentle, we can very easily fall into the trap of taking away Jesus' power, of sanitizing him and his ministry. And as our gospel reading this morning shows, Jesus was strong, he was forthright, and he could even be shocking in what he said and what he did. And there's high drama in the cleansing of the temple, it's worthy of any TV drama or film. And perhaps it overturns our image of Jesus. And our readings this morning from God, John's Gospel and also the letter to the Corinthians both relate to overturning things, of challenging our thinking, our complacency. So imagine the scene. It's a normal day in the temple courts, the temple in Jerusalem. It's the beating heart of Judaism. It's the center of worship and music, of politics and society, of national celebration and of mourning. And it's the place where God had promised to live in the heart of his people, the focal, part, the focal point of the nation. It's a center of activity, of noise, of hustle and bustle. But there's more to the noise and activity than you would expect from a place of worship. As we read, in the temple courts, he, that is Jesus, found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Cattle, sheep and doves were required for sacrifices, as set out in the laws recorded in the Old Testament. And the Jews who would have come a long distance to the temple in Jerusalem they'd have needed to be able to buy their sacrificial animals nearer to the temple. And then as many coins had to be changed into the currency that was acceptable to the temple authorities, money changers were also necessary. So far so good. Commercial activities, yes, but directed towards the worship in the temple. But all this activity was taking place in the outer courts of the temple itself. And these courts were the one place where the Gentiles would come to pray to God. And Gentiles, even those who worshipped God, the one true living God, they weren't allowed to come any closer into the very, into the more um, inner courts um, of the temple. This was the only place where they could come to be near to the living God. Yet how could they in this environment? Imagine the noise, imagine the smells. It's not a place that would have been conducive to prayer and worship. So it's hardly surprising that Jesus was incensed. As we read, so he made a whip out of cords and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, 
he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Well, you can imagine the uproar. Having spent a childhood helping to move cattle and sheep and knowing that, yeah, they can sometimes go rather astray, I can well imagine what would happen. The chaos, the mayhem, and then the shock of those on what, looking on of what Jesus had actually done. And while the cleansing of the temple is recorded by all the gospel writers, John is the only one who places it here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The other three gospels have it um, at the end. And we don't know if Jesus cleared the temples twice, that's possible, or if this only occurred once with the gospel writers placing the event um, according to their understanding. But what we do know is being recorded by all the gospel writers, Jesus definitely cleared the temple and that this was a significant event that had to be recorded. It was significant both at the time and for the implication it has for Jesus' followers then and also now. But if this did happen at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when Jesus would have arrived in Jerusalem, an itinerant preacher from Galilee, insignificant and unknown, but suddenly turning everything upside down, both literally and metaphorically. As his disciples later remembered, as they slowly began to put everything together, making sense of Jesus' ministry and beginning to understand the, how he had fulfilled his old, the Old Testament prophecies, Jesus' actions were in fulfillment of the words in Psalm 69, for zeal for your father's house, consume, for zeal for your father's house consumes me. It's interesting to note that the response of the Jews was not to question why Jesus had acted as he did, but rather to question his authority for doing so. Deep down, did they know that how they were using the temple was wrong, but they were still complacent and just kept on doing it? And I wonder, do we sometimes fall into that trap also, that we just keep on doing something, even though we know that it's not quite right, not quite appropriate, but somehow it's just easier to keep on doing the same old, same old. But perhaps the real challenge of this passage comes in what happens next. There would have been a certain logic to Jesus throwing the market out of the temple. I'll pay the shock and the audacity of this unknown itinerant preacher to take such drastic and dramatic actions. But his words in response to the Jews' questions about his authority were truly shocking. Words that challenge the very fundamental essence of the temple and indeed of Judaism. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now with the benefit of hindsight, it's easier for us to know what Jesus was talking about. But the Jews questioning Jesus in the temple didn't have that advantage. So perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on him for assuming that Jesus was talking um, literally about the physical temple that they were standing in. Now, the temple was a majestic building. If you read through the Old Testament, you get an understanding of how it was constructed and how it worked. And to see how it suffered through the violent history of the Jews, um, how it was destroyed and rebuilt. And the temple of Jesus' days it was being rebuilt by Herod, by King Herod. The reference to 46 years probably referred to work on the temple having commenced 46 years previously. But the temple wasn't actually completed until AD, AD 64, approximately 30 years later. So you can just imagine the vast scale of the, of the works and of the building um, itself. And if you visit Jerusalem today, you can get a bit of a sense of the scale and importance of the temple. There's only a small part of the Western Wall remaining, the so-called Wailing Wall. 
but it gives you a sense of what the scale of the temple must have been. And it is still one of the holiest sites um, for Jews who come to pray with strict controls and requirements for the many tourists and pilgrims who also throng to it. So it's little wonder that the Jews were confused. Firstly, how scandalous that Jesus could even hint at destroying this holiest of holy places. This place that we've already noted that was at the very heart of the Jewish nation. And then how ridiculous to suggest that such a mighty building could be rebuilt in three days. Shocking, laughable. They must have thought that Jesus was mad. But as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. It was not only the Jews who were questioning Jesus' actions who didn't understand what he was saying. His own disciples didn't either, not at this time. It was only after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. It was only then that they understood that the temple Jesus was referring to was not the temple in Jerusalem, the building, but his own body, destroyed, but raised in three days, crucified and resurrected. The heart, the center, the focal point of Christianity. But also something that many at the time and many still today see as nonsensical. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the Jews, it was unthinkable that the Messiah could be crucified by the Romans. The Messiah should have been defeating the pagans, not the other way around. And as for the Greeks and the Romans, crucifixion was the punishment for the most lowly of criminals. Unthinkable that such a person could be the savior of the world. All in all, crucifixion could only be linked to failure. As one Bible commentator states, the Christian message is all about God dying on a rubbish heap at the wrong end of the empire. It's all about the true God confronting the world of posturing, power and prestige and overthrowing it in order to set up his own kingdom, a kingdom in which the weak and foolish find themselves just as welcome as the strong and the wise, if not more so. This was the message of Jesus who throughout the minis his ministry turned the ideals and norms of established religion and society upside down. Not least of all befriending and associating with the friendless, the outcasts, those on the very margins of society. But here Jesus was standing in the midst of the temple, scattering the animals and the money changers, including the lambs that would be sacrificed sacrifices for the time of festival in Jerusalem, the festival of Passover, celebrating how God brought the children of Egypt out of slavery in e the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, bringing them to freedom and the journey to the promised land. Jesus, the Lamb of God, Jesus who would be sacrificed for us, the Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins, bringing us freedom and into the promised land of God's kingdom. A once for all sacrifice. There'd be no further need for cattle, sheep or doves to be sacrificed in the temple. And more than that, there'd be no need for the temple. As we've already seen, the temple was the symbol of God's presence with his people. In the holiest part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, 
a place that was only accessed by the priests, and even then on a very, very limited basis. But as Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross, the once-for-all sacrifice for the sin of the world, he restored the relationship between man and God. The curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn down, symbolically showing how we can have access into God's presence, a new way of worship. Unthinkable for those attending the temple. Radical. You and me, ordinary people, we're not special, we're not holy, but because we have been forgiven, because we have been cleansed through the blood of Christ, we have access into the very holy of holies, into the very presence of the living God. So what does this all mean for us today? Well, I think there's three points um, that I just want to pull out. So firstly, how do we worship? It's evident from Jesus' actions that he was concerned about worship, zeal for his father's house, for how his father was treated and honoured or not. Worship was a matter of the greatest importance for him, and that still rings true today. We may not bring cattle, sheep, doves into our churches, nor do we change money in them. But before we get too self-congratulatory, what are our attitudes coming to worship? Worship, and remembering that worship doesn't just mean singing, but it's everything in our Sunday morning services. Sunday worship, singing, prayer, listening to God's word, responding. But is our worship sometimes sloppy, superficial, careless, cold, lifeless, thoughtless? Now, thankfully, worship isn't just about the few people at the front the minister or reader, the organist, the choir. It's we all come together to worship. Is our worship really worthy of Jesus, worthy of the Lord? Do we come prepared and ready to spend quality time with our Heavenly Father? Remembering that Jesus paid the greatest of prices to overturn the old ways of worship and to enable us to come directly into God's presence. To worship in spirit and in truth. And it's not about styles of worship, whether it is traditional or contemporary, quiet or exuberant. It's about the quality of our worship, our attitude as we come to worship, each one of us. It's about the very essence of how we come to God and worship him, our Lord, our Creator, our Saviour. And then secondly, how do we treat God's temple? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. We are God's temple, the temple of the living God. And that's something quite amazing. God's spirit within us, God's presence within us. Do we ever stop and think about it? It really is quite mind-blowing. But yet, how do we treat our bodies? Think about the things we do, the things we watch, we read, we listen to. Are we filled with the world's market, the wisdom of the world? Are we allowing these to crowd in, like the cattle and the sheep in the temple? and to cry out the wisdom of God. And then thirdly, how do we relate to the wisdom of the world? Life in the 21st century is vastly different to to that in the first century. But yet, there's some things that don't change. And the wisdom of the world is still at odds with God's wisdom. For many still, Christ crucified and resurrected is still madness. Others will pay lip service to fit their own needs. Now we're privileged to live in a Christian country, yet even here our Christian values and practices are increasingly sidelined. Yet we're still free to worship and to live out our Christian lives, unlike so many Christians across the world 
for they are persecuted for their faith. But do we take that freedom for granted? It's so easy to become complacent, to find ourselves slipping into the ways of the world, gradually, imperceptibly, little by little, adopting the wisdom of the world. I've been reading a Lent book based on Celtic Christianity, and it tells of the Celtic Christians from all parts of these islands, men and women of privilege and high standing in their society, who left their wealth and their status to dedicate their lives to God and to his service. Now, not many of us will be called to renounce our homes and our families for a monastic life or for the life of a hermit. But are we prepared to set aside the things of the world that so easily entrap us, that may not be bad in themselves, but that can gradually pull us away from God? And not just for the six days of Lent, but beyond. So in conclusion, as we think about Jesus' actions and words cleansing the temple, and Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Whose wisdom are we listening to and following today? So we're going to stand and sing again our next hymn, um, Be Thou My Vision, Vision. Um, Mission Praise 51. It's one of those wonderful hymns. So let's stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision.
we remain standing as we declare together the words that we believe, uh, or declare together what we believe in the words of the creed. Um, it's on the screen and it's also on page 112 in the, um, in the prayer book. Always good to have a backup. So we stay, say together, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And if we take our seats as we come to our time of prayer. Let us pray. And the collect for today, the third Sunday in Lent. Merciful Lord, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the collect for the season of Lent. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we bring our intercessions to the Lord, and we make each prayer our own, after I say, um, Lord of Lent, joining in the response, renew our lives. Lord of Lent. Lord of Lent, come to your church and ask us your hard questions. Are we faithfully proclaiming your gospel? Are we demonstrating in our life together the justice of your kingdom? Have we welcomed the weak and given prominence to the poor? Come to your church to spring clean our ways of life, our structures and our priorities. Point out to us the cobwebs, the dirt, the extravagance and the waste. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord of Lent. Lord of Lent, come to the nations and challenge our idolatries. Sprinkling the sordid cupboard of this world's false gods. Sweep out the false pride, the self-seeking, the deceit, the corruption and lies. May the kingdoms of this earth be justice, peace and the integrity of creation. May we look beyond immediate advantage to seek the common good and be drawn to it as a lark to the dawn. And we especially remember those countries across the world where there is war, violence and persecution, especially thinking of Israel and Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan. And we ask for your peace and justice. We also ask that you would guide those in positions of power and influence across the world to make wise decisions to safeguard and sustain your creation and not to abuse or misuse it. Lord of Lent. Lord of Lent, look with compassion on those whose minds are full of anxiety and bewilderment. We remember people who are lonely, imprisoned, despairing, humiliated. Clear away from them all unnecessary feelings of fear, guilt and self-hatred. 
Assure them that when you spring clean our hearts and minds, you know what you are doing. For you have been there, one of us, and you are to be trusted. Lord of Lent, Lord of Lent, turn your healing love towards those who are sick and in pain today. We have in our hearts some known to us, some known to the church, and some known only through the news, and we bring them to mind now. Clear away from them, we pray, those things that hurt, harm, and hinder. May your healing touch have its ancient power. Lord of Lent, renew us. For ourselves, Lord, we pray that your spring clean would be thorough and true this Lent. Show us clearly those effortless sins we no longer even notice and help us to address the sins which sit on our shoulder every day, our constant companions. Give us both discipline in dealing with some faults and gentleness in dealing with others, and help us to know the difference. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Lord of Lent, renew our church, renew our world, renew our hearts, our cleansing Lord of Lent. Amen. And we bring all our prayers together as we join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. As we say, Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And before we join in our final hymn for the morning, um, just a few announcements. Um, the walking group. Um, meets this. Oh, lovely! Thank you. The walking group meets um, this Wednesday um, at, um, and I think it's to the the Broadwater in Achillay, um or meeting here at ten o'clock. Um, so do come and and join us. It's a gentle walk, but it's just nice to be out with out with folk. Um, Next Sunday morning, um, it is Cafe Church in, um, here in Glenavy at half 11, and it will be Christina Bailey, who's the church, um, the diocesan um, children's and youth officer, who is coming um, and leading our service next Sunday, so do come, come to that. Um, and then there'll be the 10 o'clock in Crumlin. There's the... Um, we'll have our prayer meeting on Wednesday, this Wednesday evening um, at 7.30 um, in, in the hall here. So again, I'd encourage you to come because I think this time during our vacancy, we just really need um, so much prayer for our parish. So um, do, do please come. Um, and nobody is put under pressure to, to pray. So just to be together, that we can pray together. Um, so, you know, please, please do come and say nobody, there's, you know, no pressure on anybody, but it's just coming together that we can pray together. Um, next Sunday morning, not next Sunday morning, next Saturday morning, there's the pop-up um, service, or pop-up shop um, in Crumlin, um, and I think, it's at, I think it's from 10 to 12, so again, um, just go and support um, uh, the ladies over in Cumlin and there's you know, coffee and tea as well so um, do, do come for that um, then uh, a meeting will be held in Cumlin Masonic Hall to form a group Friends of Cumlin War Memorial so that's Tuesday the 5th of March so that's this Tuesday night um, at 8 um, at 8 o'clock um, so 
there's, um, I think Rob needs to contact, so we'll leave that down in, down in the back for um, if anybody wants, wants to see um, a contact point for that. Um, then the following Tuesday in Soldiers Town in Achillee, um, another in their series of heritage talks on the life and art of Sir John Lavery, um, the famous artist who lived in Achillee um, for, as a child. And it's a talk by the Reverend Jim Campbell, and that's Tuesday the 12th of March um, in um, Holy Trinity Church, Soldiers Town. And there is also then on um, the 22nd of March in the Lycan Valley Island um, Hall in Lisburn, the new Irish Arts in Concert. Um, and tickets for that are on, will be on the, um, the Lycan Valley Island um, website. So a few things to think about um, to, um, for, the coming, for the coming weeks. So is there anything, anything else, any other announcements? Nope? Okay. So if we stand and sing um, our closing hymn, which is hymn 201, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah. So let's stand and sing. prayer as we go out and as we say together hopefully as we pray as we go out we say it together be with us Lord be with us Lord as we go into the world may the lips that have sung your praise always speak the truth may the ears which have heard your word listen only to what is good and may our lives, as well as our worship, be always pleasing in your sight, for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord.